positive, powerful, and emotional. Say them out loud so you can force those thoughts into your brain and the fear out. The other thing you can do is what's called autogenic or combat breathing. This is the quickest way to bring your autonomic nervous system under control. When fear kicks in, all you need to do is take a deep breath through your nose to the four count. Hold it for a four count. Let it out through the nose through a four count and do that three or four times. So a deep breath in through the nose. Hold it three or four seconds. Let it out three or four seconds through the nose, never the mouth, and do that three or four times. At Sinclair with my recruits near the end of the academy, I have them all equipped up. They've been trained completely. They know exactly what to do. And I say, you're going to go through that door and you're going to handle what's on the other side of it. That's what police work is. 90% of the time, we have no idea what we're getting ourselves into. We've got to figure it out when we get there. Immediately, you see a heart rate jump. I've got a heart monitor on them. I see sustained heart rates in training of 300 plus beats a minute. Most of you are sitting here today between 50 and 70 beats. 300 beats a minute. At 300 beats a minute, you aren't thinking, you aren't doing anything, you are frozen in time. So I have to walk up and go, breathe! And they go, oh yeah! <sighs> and in 12 seconds, I see their heart rate go from 300 beats to a minute down to a manageable 120. At 120, they can now function. At 300, they can't do anything. They can't shoot a gun, they can't even draw the gun. They can't do anything at that beat. They gotta get that under control. Breathing is the quickest way to that. It gives you something to focus on besides fear, right? And it's easy enough to do because it cleans the mind, it gives you oxygenated blood, all right? And it's very simple to do. Let's say you breathe in for three seconds instead of four. Is that gonna matter? No, okay? Just a deep breath through your nose, hold it for a little while, let it out. Do that three or four times. Never breathe through your mouth. In the back of your throat, there's a nerve called a vagus nerve. If you breathe through your mouth, it stimulates a dump of adrenaline. If you watch a professional fighter, any professional fighter, when they are about done, when they know they're out of gas, they spit the mouthpiece out and they start mouth breathing because they know they're going to get more oxygen and it's going to kick in adrenaline and they're going to have a little bit, another 60 to 90 seconds of energy that they can get out of themselves to maybe pull this thing out. If they don't in that 60 to 90 seconds, they're done. And they know it. Have you ever almost been in a car accident or the bad guy jumps out at the movies and scares you? and then you're sitting there doing this kind of a thing, that's not fear. That is the chemical adrenaline burning out of your bloodstream. You got afraid in that second, the brain dumped adrenaline into the body, and now it's got to get rid of it, and it gets rid of it through those ways. You can only function under adrenaline for 60 to 90 seconds, you're done. With my recruits, I'll have them do a drill. I'll say, you're going to run down the hall like you're chasing somebody, and you're going to fight a mannequin that's in the room. You're going to fight him for one minute, now I'm dealing with men and women who are in their 20s. What do you think, when I, what do you think they think when I say it's a one minute fight? What do you think they do to me? No problem. Okay? 35 to 40 seconds into the fight, energy level drops, they become sloppy, they become out of control, there's no power, their hands are dropping, they're not defending themselves anymore, and he ain't hitting back! He's just taking it. So I can tell you, even conditioned folks, at 40, 50, 60 seconds are out of it. Most fights don't last that long. They're over fairly quickly in real life. You've got to control fear. You will be afraid. Use these tools. Breathing, focus, and positive self-talk. The other thing you can do is what's called visualization. You can practice in your brain. What would I do if? Make it as real as you can. Be in a mentally safe place. Close your eyes and imagine. What would I do if something happened to me here and how would I handle it? Make it as real as you can. Because what happens is, you will pose this option to your subconscious mind, it will work on the plan forever. Because the conscious mind decides what you want, subconscious mind decides what you get and how you're going to get it. So one day, you're in the bathroom and your brain goes, ding, hey, and you go, that's an epiphany, right? The subconscious mind worked on the problem you posed and gave you the answer and said, this is the best I got. This is your plan. You now have a plan and it will work for you. And visualizing the plan will make it better. Because here's why. The brain doesn't know the difference between something vividly imagined and something real. It can't tell the difference. 
So if I practice in my mind a hundred times, I see myself succeeding every time, never failing. So when I actually go to do the skill, my brain goes, you've done this a thousand times. This is no big deal. All right? That's called stress inoculation. I'm literally inoculating myself from the stress because I've done it so many times, I'm now comfortable in this environment. It's how mountain climbers do it. Imagine the first time you guys got in an automobile and had to drive. And they go, okay, you've got a clutch, and you've got a brake, and you've got gas. I've got to deal with three pedals and a stick shift knob, and I've got all these gears that looks like the interior of an F-14. And I've got to pay attention to other drivers, and this is way too much information, right? Now you guys drive and text and talk and put on makeup and look at maps and drink sodas and change radio channels all the same time while driving because you are no longer stressed by that skill. You become proficient at it. You can do that with any skill. You can manage fear that way by visualizing how to do it, putting yourself in the scenario, making it as real as you can, and then seeing yourself succeed every time. Those four are the easiest ways to manage the fear process. You will be afraid. It's going to happen. Understand when it's happening and then manage the process as best you possibly can, okay? This is pretty simple. Never be taken. If someone wants to move you from point A to point B, why do they want to do that? Yeah, it's their territory, isn't it? Here's why. They want to move you someplace that they can do something so bad to you, they cannot do it here. And they know every step they take towards their domain, okay, gives them more control and more safety and you less control and less safety. So at the end of the day, there's not one thing that you own that's worth getting hurt or dying for. Nothing. Give it up. I don't care if it's got sentimental value, antique value, you give it up. It's not worth your life. You, on the other hand, are. So if you've given them everything and you read in this scenario, they're still going to hurt you. They want to move you from someplace. You've got to, have a, you've got to make a decision. I either fight or I run, but I've got to do one of the two. And whatever the plan is, I execute it fully and I never second guess myself. If it's fight, kick it up and get it done. Every ounce of power you got, you hit them as hard as you can every time you can. If it's run, turn on those flyers and hit, the, and hit it going fast. Move from position to cover to cover. Try to get to someplace safe, but you've got to have situational awareness, don't you? I'm in a scenario, and I go to run that direction. That's a problem. That's the direction I want to run. So I've got to know my surroundings, because he's standing there with a gun on me. I can't go, just give me a second. <laughs> got it. Right? He knows what I'm going to do now. So I've got to already know the door's that way, because I was aware of my surroundings. I've got to pay attention all the time. But never let them take you. Can I tell you unequivocally that every time you are moved from point A to point B, it's going to turn out badly? I can't. I can tell you the odds are very much against you, though. Because the question is, why do you want me? You've got everything I've got. Why do you want me? And if you think no matter what happens here today, you're going to get hurt or killed, you've got to do something. Okay? For me, it's like watching those old World War II videos or films where Nazi soldiers are walking people to a pit to shoot them in the head ain't happening. Okay, I'm running. You might miss, I might make the tree line, and I might survive, but for God's sakes, I'm not giving you my life. You're going to take it. So you've got to suck that up and go, you know what, I'm fighting here today. And that fight is running, run. If it's fight, fight. But whatever you got to do, crank it up and get it done. But don't let them move you. That's not good usually. And by usually, I mean high 90%. Not usually turns out very well. All right? I'm not there with you when it occurs, so I can't tell you. You have to read in the situation what you think is going to happen. And there is no cookie cutter approach to any of this. I can't say in situation A, do B. I can't do that. There are too many variables. But you've got to read the situation and go, I think this is bad. What am I going to do? You've got to control that fear process, though, or you're not going to be thinking like that. You're going to be frozen up. Okay? So think about, I could become a victim. What would I do if? If you do those things, you're ahead of the game. Okay? Never give up. To give up is to die. No matter how bad the odds are against you, you got to figure out how to get out of this. Okay? Figure a way out. Churchill said it better than anybody could say it during the Blitz. We will never, never, never give up. You got to make them take it. Don't give it to them. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the Bernard Getz story. How many remember that? Remember him? They sat on the subway car 
while he walked down the line and shot them one at a time. Fifteen people can take one guy out. Is it scary? Yeah, it's scary. But the alternative is scarier. You knew what he was going to do. He had committed himself to it and was prepared to die, which is what most active shooters are going to have done. So you know that's what's going on. You've got to suck it up and you've got to get it done. All right? Because you may win, and you're going to do your best to win. But just don't give up. Okay, that's bad. Never give up. You've got a lot of stuff to win for. I read every single police report that comes through the Central Police Operations Division, as does Merwin in the east and John in the, east, the north, northeast part of the city. They read the reports. When we read the reports, we notice certain salient techniques or principles that bad guys operate under. You tend to see the same kind of thing running through crime. These are the tactics that they use most of the time to get you. Could I borrow you for a minute, sir? I guess you can't say no, there can you? <laughs> I got gotcha. you. You're a captive audience. I know. <laughs> Put your hands together like you're praying. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to touch you on this shoulder. All I want you to do is block. All right. Either way you want. You can use two hands, one hand, just block my hand. Okay, ready? Okay. Oh. I can do this with my eyes closed. Yeah. <laughs> Why can I hit him at will? Because you know where you're going to hit. No. I'm going to tell him. Put your hands up. I'm going to hit you in one second. One. Uh. Why can't he stop me? Can't predict where you're close. Right. There you go. Right. I am too close. At this distance, mm -hmm. he can hit me and I cannot stop him. And I can hit him and he cannot stop me. Because even though he knows it's coming, by the time his mind sees the action, formulates a response, and executes the response, it's over. Okay? At this distance, I can be going, really? Pow! Mm -hmm. Okay? This looks like I'm just thinking, wow, really? No kidding? <laughs> it's done. Okay? And in reality, most fights, the guy who lands the first blow is going to be the winner in real street com combat. Because number one, once I hit him, I'm going to hit him a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. I'm not going to let him physically or psychologically recover from the blow. I'm going to push him until he's done. So, when you do not trust people, you keep them outside what we call the reactionary gap. This is too close. Put your hand out if you would. This is a reactionary gap. Now put your hands up. I'm going to touch you on that shoulder. He has time and distance working for him as opposed to against him. So when someone approaches you in any scenario and you get that intuitive flash, you immediately use this hand as your first line of defense. Stay there and you create some distance from them. If you can put a range extender between you and them, which is a table, a pole, a car, a fence, anything that slows their forward momentum up, do it. But you keep them at this distance because at this distance, you can relax. <laughs> she whiz. I didn't know what was oh going on. Oh my gosh. Am I that scary? <laughs> <laughs> Could be. <laughs> How many of you have seen fights and this is where they start? Right. Okay? That's over. All the, the, the guy who lands the first blow, all he did was think, I'm going to hit you first. It's done. We've got to keep him outside that reactionary gap. You'll watch police officers interview people. They will not only try to keep them here, they will also blade off to one side, so they now only have to deal with this side of their body and not all four weapons. So that's called relative positioning. I only want to deal with one side. I've bladed my body so my weapon is away but I'm also not that close to him. So we can still talk, can't we? And really, in our, social, in our social circles, in our world, this is a pretty comfortable place to converse. We really don't like people this close to us. That's just part of our culture. So this is comfortable anyway. So keep them outside that gap. If you do that, you've got some time and distance that you can work with. Now, they use a plethora of tactics to get inside that gap. Because remember, the first thing they do is they start way out here and they say, oh yeah, he looks like a good victim. As we get closer to each other, I have a series of tools that I use to get into this gap. Because I know if I start back here and I start to become aggressive, you're either going to run or be prepared to fight. I need to get closer to you and I need to do it in a very artistic way. So I'm going to use a series of techniques. Hey man, you know what time it is? If I do that, what am I not looking at? Me. So the second he looks at the watch, I step in. If I say, I've got a dollar, I need four quarters for a meter, what's he going to do? He either says, right, he puts his hand in his pocket, that's a cloth set of handcuffs. And if he actually pulls his hand out and starts doing this number, 
Okay, what's he not looking at? Me. And I know in that moment in time, that's when I bridge this gap. And now I'm here. So what occurs a lot of times in criminal encounters is a brief but critical interview. At this level, they know they've selected you as a victim. They can abort at any time and you'll never know. They are doing one more assessment of you and going, that's why they come up with some really creative stories. Directions, time. I don't care if you gotta watch around your neck like that, like Flava Flav, and you go, I don't know what time it is for you. I don't know, if you can't tell what time it is, I ain't telling you, right? And it doesn't look like you even need to be anywhere, okay? If he's got pockets bulging with change, I don't want him digging his pants. I don't, I, yeah, I, got, I don't care if he's walking down the street whistling, I'm in the money, right? I ain't got no money for you. If I don't trust you, I got to keep you at a distance. So the language that I use, both body language and words, are going to be short. Sorry, I don't have any money for you. And you keep moving, all right? They're going to ask you for directions. If I ask him for directions, are the thing I'm asking for going to be behind me or behind him? Behind him, right? So he has to turn and do that number, and the second he does, I bridge the gap again. Just understand there are a plethora of techniques they use to get here. They can get very creative and artistic about this. They are very good at it. This is how they survive. So they, come, they become very, it seems very genuine. They're very artistic about the process. There are lots of ways. The second that intuition says, I don't trust this person, you immediately put the guard up, get the hand out, and you give them very strong language. I'm not asking you to challenge them. He walks up and asks me for money, I don't say, get a job, right? <laughs> I don't want you to do that.